aspired to was not a rhetorical question. I'm serious. Do you want to be a great church today? Yes. I'm not convinced. Do you want to be a great church today? Yes. 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 Let's go to work. Let's begin. It's the most necessary work of all, the work of prayer. Father, Lord, I believe these people when they say they will be a great church. Lord, I do not know their hearts, but you know their hearts. <coughs> Lord, you know my heart, what condition it is in. Lord, if we are ever to make any headway in this battle, we wage within ourselves and without ourselves against the sin nature and the demonic forces and all the world that is against you and against those of us who are for you. Lord, we must have your help, and we must have it right here, right now, today. We must have your abiding presence. It must be here behind this pulpit that these should be indeed your word infused with your power that they might have the ring of truth about them, that they might take home to the hearts of all those who hear, and that your abiding presence there should give witness to their truth and cause them to be implanted deeply into those hearts where they might abide and bring about the fruit only your abiding grace can bring. Lord, I pray your will would be done here today through the preaching of your word and all else that goes on. Lord, I pray for those churches that are on either side of us, Lord, our sister churches all throughout the city of Lebanon and all throughout Wilson County in the state of Tennessee and these United States of America, Lord, and all over the world, wherever your word is opened by preachers and pastors who would speak it truly to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth that you would empower them and encourage them and enable them to do exactly that to your glory and Lord wherever your word is being dismissed wherever it is being twisted wherever it is being undermined wherever men have approached it to speak their own truth instead of the truth Lord I pray you would foil them in every instant that they would find themselves unable to resist your will that you would master them and overpower them and turn their intents to your intent Lord I pray your work and your will should be done all over the world today and every Sunday Lord, to you be all glory and honor and dominion forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians, chapter 2, and beginning in verse 14. The book of Philippians, chapter 2, and beginning in verse 14. Philippians is just a little bit past the halfway mark in your New Testament. As you're turning there, allow me to catch you up with what is going on here. Paul is writing this letter from prison. That's very important to remember as we look at today's passage. Very important to remember where Paul is as he writes this. He is in prison. And he is writing to the church at Philippi, which is one of the first churches that Paul plants in his missionary journey. The book of Philippians has been called the happiest book in the New Testament. How ironic that it should be written by a man who, from all outward appearances, ought to be miserable. The occasion for his writing is that the Philippians have sent him some provision. You see, back when Paul was in this Roman prison, they didn't feed you or give you a bed or a blanket or anything like that. Instead, you were reliant either on your own personal wealth to provide these needs or the wealth of other benefactors. That is the occasion. The reason I think that this is the happiest 
book. We have that perception of it. It's because it is a book with a single focus. From the very beginning all the way through to where we are, Paul is continually urging the church at Philippi and urging us here at Grace Bible Church today to have about them a single focus, a united focus under the headship of Christ. And that focus is the gospel of Christ, which he has just beautifully expressed in the verses preceding our passage today. In fact, the preceding verses are so important to what we look at today. And I'm going to read up to our passage. Starting in verse 5 of Philippians 2. And I will read us up to verse 14. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. The word of the Lord, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, if you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And now verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. You may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as light in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news of a victory. A victory that was won through the greatest act of humility that could ever have been performed. For Jesus descended from the highest height to the lowest low, so that coming underneath us all, taking on himself the fullness of the punishment that we deserve in our sin, was able to bear us up with himself in a victory that is universal and sure. And at the same time, it is deeply personal and immediate. It is a wonderful victory. The fullness of what we could spend our entire lives and indeed all of eternity unpacking and realizing. It is a victory in which we have been invited to participate in our own lives by taking up the labor side by side with the Spirit of God itself within us to continue to move towards the perfection of Christ, to become more and more as he was. And after Paul has given us this wondrous command, after he has urged us on to this incredible work, he takes it down and gives us a specific instance where we need to apply them, and he singles out grumbling and disputing. He singles us out, and he singles it out within the context of a church. Paul is talking to a whole group of believers. It's not a one-person affair here. But he had in mind the full body doing this work in community when they are gathered and when they go out from each other. The church does not cease to exist on Monday. The church is just as much a presence when we are not in this building as it is when we are. 
Do all things without grumbling or disputing. All things. Not just the things you do in here. Not just the things you do when you've got your Christian hat on, your helm of salvation. All things, because once you put that helm of salvation on, it doesn't come back off. You might forget it's there sometimes, but it never comes off. So do all things in this manner, without grumbling or disputing. There is a great danger today is that we could mishear this command. And if we mishear this command, it will lead us inevitably to disaster. So I want to be very, very clear about what grumbling particularly is. If we understand what grumbling is here, it will help us understand also what disputing is. And I think we have a better handle on disputing than we do on grumbling. You look up the definition of grumbling, it will say it's a certain way of complaining under the breath. It's complaining that's done in private. It's kind of low-key complaining, but it's complaining nonetheless. What is complaining? If you want to know what complaining looks like and what it actually does, go back to the book of Exodus. And look at the Israelites. <coughs> they spend most of that book complaining. And by looking at that example, I think we see three things which define and characterize the act of complaining. The first thing I think we see is that complaining is incessant. It doesn't end. Put another way, it never satisfies. First, the Israelites are complaining. We see them because they're enslaved in Egypt. They're being forced into labor. They're being abused and mistreated. At the very beginning of this book, they're so abused and mistreated that Pharaoh comes through and he wipes out a whole generation of them. And then, years later, God tells Moses to go back and bring them out, and no sooner have they gotten out than they start complaining that they want to go back because they're out here in the wilderness. They don't have any food, they say, so God provides food. This isn't good enough, they say. We want better food, so God provides them better food. We're tired of sitting out here in the wilderness. We want to go someplace. He takes them someplace. We can't go in there. It's full of giants. They're never satisfied. Whatever God gives them, they always want something more, something better, or something else they lack. It's never satisfied, and so it is with all the other complainers that we see, even in our own lives. Lord, I just want a job. Just let me go to work. I just want to have something to do. I don't care what it is. Just let me go someplace and do something and make some money. Lord, I just want a salary job. Get me out of this hourly wage stuff. Just want, just want a salary job. Lord, I just want 35000 more than I'm making right now. And some benefits. And a company car. <laughs> and a key to the executive bathroom. There's always something else. Even in marriage we do this. How many times have I dealt with people who they have a wife, a beautiful wife, a devoted wife, a God-fearing wife who is doing her best to work out her salvation, and they're going, look, she doesn't make me happy anymore. Lord, I just want a woman that makes me happy like she, or, I, I just want a woman that doesn't have this problem. I just can't deal with this. Deal with all kinds of things that never satisfy. Whatever is provided, it's never enough. It just keeps going and going and going. And part of the reason it keeps going is because the second characteristic we noted is that complaining is entirely unproductive. In fact, it's counterproductive. It's regressive. 
When the Israelites complain all throughout the book of Exodus, what are they constantly saying? When we were in Egypt, when we were in Egypt, we had food. When we were in Egypt, we had meat. When we were in Egypt, we had houses. We had this. We had that back there. That's what complaining is like. It always looks back. It never looks forward. It never does anything. It never lifts a finger to change circumstances. It's always longing for the things it remembers it used to have. Lord, I, I just really missed when I was off on my own and I was there in Louisville on my own and I had my own place and I went to bed when I decided and I got up when I decided and I decided what I was going to do first thing in the morning and what I was going to eat last thing at night and Lord, just let me be off on my own. <coughs> Lord, there are no sidewalks here. You know, when I was in Louisville, I used to be able to just walk wherever I wanted to go, just miles in any direction. I had this freedom, and I could just go places. Lord, there aren't any sidewalks here. I was so much better off. It keeps going, always looking back. And it never remembers the things that were wrong. Past just keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter. The future dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And so you end up spending your whole life trying to go backwards, trying to throw this into reverse, which of course we cannot do. And so we end up stalled as the Israelites are. And you can read the book of Exodus for yourself and you'll see as long as they're complaining, they never move. never go forward. This is especially true spiritually. The last truth of complaining, the last characteristic, the last defining feature is that complaining is always egocentric. It's always egocentric. It's always about me. When I was in Egypt, I had food. I'm hungry. Feed me. I want meat. I want a house. I want to go someplace. I want a better wife. I want a better job. Me, me, me. My needs, my felt wants, my desires. Satisfy me. Complaining is a symptom of pride. Complaining is the gravitational force which exerts itself out from the egocentric being. It is a result. Of having yourself at the center of the universe. It is a really desperate thing. It's a really desperate thing because the force that you can exert is tiny. Even the most powerful men in the world, we all remember an old folk tale about the humble farmer who's out laboring one day and he sees this merchant come by and says, oh, if only I could be the merchant because he has all these things I don't have. And he becomes the merchant and he realizes that the merchant is not as great as the noble, so he wants to be the noble, but the noble might bow to the emperor, so he wants to be the emperor, but the emperor can't control the cloud, and so he wants to be the cloud, and he wants to be the sun. Perhaps you've heard the old European tale of the fisherman's wife and his fisher man. He goes out and he catches a magic fish, and the fish will grip him, and he will wish that he wants. And this, this guy, he's just a salt the earth guy. He doesn't want anything. So he goes back and he asks his wife, because the wife always knows what to want, right? <laughs> and she, she says, well, we live in a shack, man. We're living in a pigsty. I asked him for a better house, you ninkin poop. <laughs> and he goes back and he asks for a better house. And he comes back and he says, isn't hey, this a great house? Look at this place. You got like three bedrooms, two baths. It's awesome. You idiot, you could have 
ask for a castle. Go back and ask for a castle. And she keeps going and she wants to be a noble and she wants to be the queen and she wants to be the pope and then she wants to be God. When she asked to be God, the magic fish has finally had enough. They go right back to the pigsty. There's a lot of truth in these old folk tales, I'm telling you. This is what complaining shows us that we are trying to be God. We are desiring to be God. We are wanting our needs to be met. We are saying, my will be done. My kingdom come. We demand more and more and more. We are never satisfied in it. So it is incessant, it is futile. And it's all about us. It's an exhausting way to live. At the same time in saying all these things, I have opened up the road to the other extreme. I have opened up a second danger. Because there is a certain lie that has infiltrated and snaked its way into the church, especially in the older generation. The lie often stated in that phrase, God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. I almost want to take a survey of how many people believe this to be true, or how many have said it, or how many are trying to live by it right now. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm just going to tell you this is a lie from the pit. God helps those who help themselves. No, he doesn't. In fact, he cannot help those who can help themselves because no such people exist. Look at the Israelites in Exodus again. They can't help themselves. Or go back. Go back even further. The very first complaint we ever see in human history. You'll find it in Genesis 3. You all know the story. The serpent comes into the garden. There's one tree that we're not supposed to eat from. The serpent circumvents the structure that God has put in place. Goes to Eve. And as he really said, we will not surely die. Eve eats the fruit. Adam eats the fruit. Their eyes are open. They become aware of their nakedness. They try to cover their nakedness. It doesn't work. So when God comes down, they hide. When God finds them out, and he calls Adam to account, Adam complained about his wife. The woman that you gave me, which is really your fault, God. If it's not your fault, it's her fault. Because it's all about me, and I can't possibly be held responsible for the disaster that has befallen all of creation here. Why? Because he cannot help himself. And deep, deep down in Adam's soul, he realizes how bad things are. And so he tries to take the weight that will surely crush him and pass it off on Eve. Which is a terrible thing to do. It's a disgusting behavior, and yet it still happens all the time. Well, Eve isn't any stronger than her husband is, and so she tries to pass it on to the head of the serpent. The serpent has no one left to blame. He doesn't have anything to complain about. He's done all of his complaining prior to this. All three of these characters are utterly helpless. They are doomed. They are done. They are finished. It is over until God steps in and offers them help. He makes them a promise that he is going to right the wrong they have committed because he knows they can never do it 
themselves. And then, he replaces their pathetic fig leaf garment with garments that actually accomplish the purpose. They could even make clothes good enough to cover their nakedness. They could even help themselves with that first felt need they had. God had to do it. The same thing with the Israelites. Every time they complain, they don't even try to take care of it themselves because they probably realize how futile that attempt would be. There's just no hope for it until God shows up. They cannot help themselves. And so it is with all of us here today. We cannot help ourselves. We cannot help ourselves. And so we needed help. We needed help to escape the gravitational pull of our own pride. And so God himself became the very paragon of humility, the ultimate exemplifier of humility. He performed an act of humility greater than any other act ever conceived of in order to set us free from pride and from all of its habits, including the habit of complaining, of disputing. And those who are set free, they are free indeed. Free indeed. How does this play out practically? The antidote to disease of complaint. Many people say it's counting your blessings. I recall being Crosby had a song about it. When I'm tired and I can't sleep, I count my blessings instead of sheep. And I go to sleep counting my blessings. I do not prescribe this philosophy of countering complaint. Why? Because I don't need two blessings. I don't need three blessings. I don't need five blessings. I don't need ten blessings. There's no number of blessings that are going to outweigh my ability to find things to complain about, save for one. There is only one blessing I need in order to overcome that, and that is the blessing of the grace of God made available to me through the work of Jesus Christ. The only blessing I need is that of grace through faith, not of myself, but it's a gift of God. It is the greatest blessing that countered my greatest problem in life. It is the salvific blessing, the blessing of life more abundant and free and eternal. It is the gospel that I need to counter my complaints. It is the fullness of the gospel. And the gospel begins in Genesis 3. It began with the realization that I was dead in my trespasses. That I am just as culpable as my foreparents, Adam and Eve. That I, too, have given in to the wild of the serpent and taken the forbidden fruit. I have done it again and again and again. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve the damnation penalty. We all deserve to go to hell, to suffer God's wrath forever and ever. That is the only thing I have coming to me. I need that part of the gospel most. The bad news that precedes the good news. We call that the doctrine of total depravity. And when I start to find myself complaining, that's the part I must remember first. Because that's the part that strips me of all my entitlement, 
of all of my right, of all of my perceived importance. That is the pillar of the truth of God which cast me down to the depth to which I belong and causes my pride to be shattered into a hundred thousand million pieces that could never be put back together save through an act of God. This is the one that puts me in my place to remind me, hey, Eddie, who do you think you are demanding things? Who do you think you are going on and on, no matter what you get, it's never enough? Who do you think you are making it all about you when you're less than nothing? You're the most wretched of wretched men. How dare you demand things when the only thing you have any right to is hell. And that you definitely do not want. It breaks me. I pray that it will break all of us here today. And not just today, but every day. I pray that we will live with this realization. And it will humble us, and it will break our habit of complaining, of grumbling. And then I pray that we will hear the good news of the gospel. That as low as we have been cast down, Jesus has descended lower still. He has come up underneath us and is bearing us ever upward into glory. And he has come under us to provide for our every need. We have nothing to complain about, not only because we have no right to ask for anything, but also because every provision has already been made in Christ. It is no mistake, brothers and sisters, that this call to satisfaction in Christ should come after one of the greatest explanations an exposition of the gospel in all of Scripture. It is no accident, brothers and sisters, that this call to humility and a practical cessation of complaining should come right after the reminder that Jesus came like a sheep to the slaughter. And he was the only one in all of it, the only one in all the cosmos that had any right to complain. He is the only one who deserves something better than what he got. He did it for me. He did it for you. And I am convinced by the surpassing greatness of the love on display in this book that he would have done it only for you. That were it necessary, he would do it again. But praise be to God, the work is finished. The curse is broken. Sin has no more power. The gravitational force that was exerted from the old man has been overcome by the far greater gravitational force of the Lord Jesus Christ, pulling our souls into orbit around the glory of God forever altering our trajectory within this world so that our destination is changed from that which we deserve in destruction to that which we could have never hoped for apart from Christ and glory. Do you see now why I said at the outset that this is not a roadblock, this is not an obstacle, the gospel is not an obstacle to the operation of the church, so much as it is a disease, it is a sign that we are not the church. It is a sign that we do not know the gospel. Because if we knew the gospel, there is no possibility that we could begin to consider the contemplation of registering the idea of the notion of a complaint. The gospel shatters the ego. It breaks our demanding pride. It ends the endless cycle of complaint. When the glory of God becomes the focus, everything falls into line underneath it. Look at the end of the book of Exodus, where they're building the tabernacle of God. You 
won't find any complaints in the middle of it. For this one blessed moment in that book, the people of God have turned their eyes off of themselves and have turned them toward Jesus. They have tuned their heart to sing his praise, not only in song, but in deed as well. And all these things that they do, they do them for the glory of God. And so their complaints were silent. Their complaints were silent. And they accomplish a great work. As soon as they finish that work, you know what happens? They start to move forward again. I must thank my brother Matt and his study on Exodus at the end for reminding me of this truth. It's only when the complaining stops, it's only when they're not grumbling and disputing anymore. They're able to do the work of God and so to progress in the plan that God has for them. Brothers and sisters, it was that way in the Old Testament. It's that way in the New Testament. It is that way today. A church that has in its midst those who would grumble and complain and dispute is like a body that has severe arthritis. Yes, it might still move a little, but it's going to be very slow and awkward and painful. Very, very painful. That pain, pain is never handled properly. See, those who grumble are the same people, those who complain are the same people who will go on forever and ever about how they are helping themselves, because God helps those who help themselves. The ones who complain the most, who cause the most problems in this area, are the ones who are puffed up with pride that they are not complaining. But you'll never see them crying, you'll never know they're hurt, until you try to do something. Brothers and sisters, you must be clear on what complaining is, we must be equally clear on what it is not. God does not help those who help themselves. There are no such people. And that is why it is. The people of God are called to bear one another's burdens. The command of Jesus is continually, love one another, love one another. Even as I have loved you, We cannot obey these commands as long as there are roads in their midst that would rather complain than actually deal with the issue. It is not complaining for someone to come to me and say, Brother Jared, I'm hurting today. I've got a problem today. I am stuck in a rut today. I am in the flower of despond today. I am depressed today. I am anxious today. I have an illness today. Brother, Brother Jared, I, I've been a liar. I have been lying out of my face, man. I have been speaking lies every time I open my eyes. I can't seem to break this habit. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in coming forward to the altar and falling down on your face in front of everyone and saying, Oh, Lord God, I have been a grumbler. Forgive me. Help me to preach the gospel to myself. Help me to remember these glorious truths and set me free from this so that I should no longer be an impediment to the work of your kingdom and the activity of your body here. There's no shame in that kind of confession. That is what God wants from you. The command to bear one another's burden only works when we will lay our burdens out so that our brothers and sisters may help us take them up. There's no shame in letting people see you cry be not read the Beatitudes where Jesus said, Bless the road to war, for they will be comforted. 
comfort we gotta wait for when God himself will dry our tears when we reach that glad celestial shore on Jordan's other side. But some of that comes today. Some of that comes now. We're singing confines of just local expression of the body of Christ. As we who know Christ and have the abiding presence of his spirit minister the truth of the gospel to one another. This can only happen when we stop complaining about complaining. When we stop complaining about how strong we are, how independent we are, how capable we are. We stop insisting on me. We start openly confessing, earnestly sharing. When we allow ourselves to be weak so that his strength may be made perfectly evident in us and through us. If you want to be a great church today, you must not be a church that grumbles. You must not be a church that disputes, that has two people, two grumblers coming together and complaining against each other. You must be a church that has a working nervous system, where the pain signals run up and down. When something goes wrong, it doesn't just stay in that area and fester and fester, but the pain goes up to the leaders of the church and they say, oh no, our left arm is badly hurt. We need to nurse it back to health. We need to give attention to that. We need to rest it up and restore it. What happens in so many churches is that these people are so puffed up in their pride the one thing that you see them complaining about is all the other people who are just throwing their weakness all over the place. The one thing they really complain about is that anyone would ever ask them to be honest. And so the pain stays localized. It never goes up, it never goes down. It's never shared with anyone that could do anything about it. It just festers. And the church, not knowing that it's injured, continues to do all the things that it's always done, and it aggravates the injury, and it gets worse and worse until finally the limb just falls off entirely. And the rest of the body is left there standing and stunned and amazed, going, my, my arm's off. How did this happen? I don't under, there was no warning, there was no signal here, there was no sign, I never, I mean, I thought these people were so strong. They never complained, they never confessed, they never... I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't wanna have a church of complainers. But if the choice is between complaining or just holding it all inside, please complain. And don't just complain off in private. Come to me, okay? You don't have to tell anybody else. I will make it completely confidential. You have my word. Nobody else will know who said that. But please come to me. And if you, you vent as much as you want to, if you need my whole day and part of my night, so be it. If you need me to get up at 2 in the morning and come over here and sit up with you till 2 the next morning, then you can just pour out all this bitterness and resentment and frustration. So be it. If you need to complain, come and complain to me. But let somebody know. Let somebody know so that one of us, at least, can take some action can do what Moses did and take it to the one who can actually help us. I would prefer that we not complain. I would prefer that this be a body that has an open communication where there's no need to complain because if we're hurting, we can just tell somebody and the rest of the body comes in and closes it around us and lifts us up and ministers to us. 
bring us to the one who can heal us. If there's something that's broken up the wrong way, something we need done, something we feel needs to be done, if there's something aggravating us, irritating us, we don't have to let it fester and insist on our own way. We can just bring it up and trust that God's going to deal with this through the proper channel to make the whole body aware so we can all pray over it. That we can maintain the <coughs> unity in the mind of Christ. Christ was not a complainer. He never insisted on his own rights. And there came a point even at his lowest moment when he was most in distress, when he most desired that he could have his way. He did pray, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But what are his next words? Not my will, but thine be done. And then when better Adam, the complaining stops here. The fulfillment of Israel. He lets God know what he wants. He confesses. He lets his closest disciples stand in weakness. He lets all of us stand in weakness. We know that from the shortest verse in the Bible. You'll find it in John 11. Jesus wept. He wasn't afraid to confess. He wasn't afraid to put it out in the open when he was hurting, when he was low, when he needed some help. He wasn't afraid to let people know what he wanted, but he didn't cross that line over into complaining. Now instead, he surrenders his will to God's will. Brother, at the end of the day, beloved, at the end of the day, this is what Paul wants from us. This is the focus he's been drawing us toward. This is the command that he has given us here, stated most plainly. We should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We should pray when we pray, Thy will be done. We should make it all about Him. And when you do that, when you begin to take those steps towards bringing your mind into that unity with Christ, you will begin to know satisfaction like you have never known before. Not because you're going to get everything you ever want. Not because the Lord is going to richly bless you with all the prosperity of this world, but because he's going to give you something even better. He's going to satisfy not the hunger of the day, not the hunger of this life, but the greater hunger. going to give you the bread of his body and the drink of his blood. He's going to give you the solution to sin, the cure to death, the end and toil of an egocentric complaining lifestyle. You're going to slay your greatest enemy, your own pride. Set you free from those shackles and change the whole trajectory of your life. That you will grow greater and greater. You will go higher and higher. Let me pray. Father, Lord, we grow up complaining. It is the first language we learn how to speak. It is the first action any of us take. As Augustine so rightly observed, Lord, for us from the cradle, 
We are demanding our own way. The Lord is so natural, so ingrained, so embedded, but so difficult to war against. Lord, we are helpless. I confess it. There is not I can do against this. I need your help, your provision. I need the gospel, Lord, and I need it daily ministered to me. Lord, I pray that I would be open to ask. If you would put around me those who can help me when I am too weak to preach it to myself. Lord, I pray this would be a church filled with weak men and women. We're not ashamed of our weakness, but openly confess it. To cut off complaining at the path, but stop it before it can begin by expressing their need openly and earnestly and submitting it all to you. Lord, I pray we would be unified in the spirit of humility, that we might have a church, Lord, not just a group of people who come together to say your name a lot and to sing about you and to do these empty rituals and rites. We would be a church united in spirit, seeking to follow Christ and his example, doing the work he has laid before us. Lord, I pray that we would look like him, sound like him, act like him, smell like him, feel like him. Lord, it can only happen if we will be without grumbling and complaining. Lord, if there are any here who are still living at night, I pray you would hound them day and night until they bow their knee to you. If there are any who are living in bondage to it, I pray you would pursue them even to the end of the earth, that they would never have a moment's peace until they come to the Prince of Peace in all submission. Lord, if there are those here who still believe that ancient lie that Satan himself has forced among us, I pray that they would be hounded day and night, that their sleep would be taken from them, that you would break them into pieces until they have no choice but to admit that God does not help those who help themselves because there are no such people. Lord, I do not pray these things because I am a demand who delights in suffering. Lord, I pray them because I wish to see an end to suffering. I pray them because I have been that man broken in my own life. And I know that rest only comes through brokenness. I know that freedom only comes when we surrender. Lord, I pray these things not for my own sake, but for the sake of your gospel and your glory, your will be done here, Lord, even now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are here today, if you are here and you have been complaining your whole life, you have two choices. You can continue to complain for the rest of your life and you will die and have much more to complain about. You will never be satisfied. You will never know any rest. You will chase around one corner after another, after another, until there are no more corners. Or you can come right here, right now to Christ, and he can fill you. He can satisfy your thirst and your hunger again and again and again. He can take you to the place you've always wanted to go. He can show you the love you have always longed to feel. He can give you that purpose that you have sought for. He can and he will. If you will only come. If you are here today and you are in Christ, and you have been complaining about this or that, maybe your complaint has been, I, I can't be baptized, it's humiliating. Go up there before all those people and be dunked under the water. Why would God ask me to do that? He died on a cross in public for you. What right do you have to complain? To give public profession of the wonderful work that he has done in your life. And he was not ashamed to shed his blood before the multitude to accomplish it. You're here and you're just a complainer. You're just living in it. 
You're giving up fighting it. You need to get right with God. You need to do it now. You need to do it now because the Lord's supper table sits behind you. We are about to, after this hymn of invitation, to take this blessed meal together in remembrance of the satisfaction we have in Christ. But we cannot do that unless we are living in it. So Paul warns us that if we take this meal and our life is not matched up with the truth it represents, that we are eating our own condemnation. I do not want that to happen today. Don't be ashamed to come up here and let people know you need to talk to God. 